Dear colleagues from Europe and indeed around the world, welcome to today's ERA webinar on contact sensing for ablation. What have we learned and how to use it? I am Professor Richard Schilling from Barts Heart Centre in London, UK. The aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of contact force sensing. Here are my disclosures. We hope that at the end of this seminar you'll understand the technology, the pros and cons of the various options, what aspects of clinical ablation procedures this technology may help with, how to interpret force sensing data, the pitfalls of contact force measurement and how to avoid them, and have a knowledge of the scientific literature examining the use of contact force and what this means for clinical practice, and know what future developments may offer to some of the shortcomings of contact force sensing. Our cases and presentations will be made by Professor Deepan Shah from the Cardiology Electrophysiology Unit, University of Hospital Geneva in Switzerland, and Roland Tills from University Herzentrum in Lübeck in Germany. At the end of this 60-minute live event, you'll be able to safely interpret contact force data, minimize the risks of your procedures, maximize the success rates of your procedures. This session is highly interactive and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions or your comments at any time through the webinar through the chat. For the best learning experience, we also invite you to participate in the online assessment sessions in the form of NCQs that will be submitted during the presentation. Anything you need to know, just ask and we'll provide tips and tricks for your daily clinical practice. This webinar is possible thanks to an unrestricted educational grant from Biosense Webster. Now I'll hand over to Professor Shah. Thank you very much, Richard. Good afternoon and welcome, everybody. I'm Deepan Shah from the Cardiac Electrophysiology Unit at the University Hospital in Geneva. And I'm going to speak to you today about contact sensing for castor ablation. These are my disclosures. You're all, or many of you are all aware of the traditional parameters of lesion control for radio frequency uh, castor ablation. Typically target electrode temperature in the temperature mode, delivered radio frequency power for the power mode, duration of RF delivery. But of course, electrode tissue contact is very important and has been, till recently, very difficult to quantitate. Contact evaluation has been more an art than a science, incorporating various components such as fluoroscopy, tactile feedback, electrograms, electrode temperature, impedance, and in some cases, intracardiac echo-based visualization. It is, of course, the onset or the availability of real-time contact sensing that has allowed us to gain a new and valuable parameter of controlling lesion size. If you look at electrode tissue contact conceptually, one can think of it as being made up of two components. The magnitude of the surface area of the electrode in direct contact with the tissue, the so-called contact footprint, and its stability. And that stability, again, you can think of it in two ways. It's spatial stability, such as indicated by minimizing sliding of the tip electrode over the endocardium, or temporal stability, maintaining stable levels of contact over time. And as you'll see, both of these are very important. We performed the first experiments with a real-time contact force sensor incorporated within an irrigated tip catheter, as you can see in the picture up uh, on the upper left here. This picture next to it shows you an in, the result of an in vitro experiment, one of the earliest that we performed with uh, such a prototype catheter uh, delivering RF power at 40 watts, a fixed power, but uh, with varying contact forces. And as you can see with the naked eye, the lesion size clearly increases both in terms of width and depth with increasing contact force. This relationship is clearly shown here in graphical form based on experiments performed both in Geneva and at the University of Oklahoma. And you can see that there is a linear relationship between increasing contact force and lesion volume on the y-axis for 30 watts fixed power as well as 50 watts fixed power. 
And of course, on the right-hand side, what is clear is that with increasing contact force, the probability of a steam pop increases both at 30 watts and at 50 watts. The exact mechanism of increasing contact force and control, control of lesion size remains to be conclusively shown, but we have some insights. This, is, this, this slide shows you results of an experiment using a specially developed irrigation caster with an integrated three-dimensional ultrasound sensor on its tip, which allows visualization, real-time visualization of atrial tissue or ventricular tissue. Matthew Wright, in this experiment, performed experiments in an ex vivo porcine segment of the left atrium, pushing a caster with 10 grams of contact force against two different parts of the left atrium, the PV ostium and the left atrial roof, and he visualized, as you can see here, the ultrasound thickness, ultrasound based thickness with varying forces, as well as comparing it to the wall thickness derived from pathology, and found that 10 grams contact force reduced the wall thickness by 50, 255% at the PV ostia, whereas uh, the same force reduced it to a lesser extent at the left atrial roof, suggesting tissue compression was important, but also suggesting regional differences. I would like to show you this slide, which exhibits an, a form of castor force-induced mechanical electrophysiological effect. This is a tracing of a residual fascicle in the right inferior pulmonary vein with the ablation castor with a one gram contact force placed at the ostium of the right inferior pulmonary vein. The castor contact force is increased during the course of the slide. And when the contact force exceeds 10 grams approximately and reaches 12 grams, you can see that the residual fascicle disappears coincident with the appearance of large deflections and the ostium without the castor moving from the site, attesting to the mechanical traumatizing effect of increased force, which of course is one component of the effect of the contact force. Now I'd like to show you this, uh, um, this question here. Which of the following statements is or are true? Increasing contact force results in lower impedance or does it result in higher impedance? or in higher electrode temperature, or lower electrode temperature, or increased tissue temperature. I think these choices are, 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 have been um, selected here to highlight the possible different roles of increasing contact force on tissue and on clinical electro electrophysiology in general. Let's see what you as an audience have to say about this. So we've had a question from the audience already, so thank you for sending in your questions so quickly. And one of them, is, is there any difference between the pediatric population and the adult population using contact force? Is there any data to steer us that they should be treated any differently? There is no data to, to, to actually attest to that difference, but we are well aware of differences in tissue from uh, different parts of the heart and, and as well as uh, different species of hearts. And therefore, it is totally possible that uh, pediatric tissue behaves differently. My own clinical insight from having done pediatric electrophysiology is that the tissue is much more sensitive and softer to manipulation and to trauma in general. So I would expect that perhaps you might want to modify your, your, your uh, ablation targets, particularly contact force and power, when you ablate um, pediatric patients. So I'm very glad that the audience have joined us because they clearly are going to learn a lot from this talk because the answers have been neck and neck, uh, lower impedance, or increased tissue temperature as being the result of increased contact force? I'm surprised at this answer for lower impedance. What actually happens with increasing contact force, as you well know, is that the, the electrode tip gets buried into the soft tissue, reducing the amount of surface of the electrode exposed to the surrounding high conductivity blood, and that is the mechanism whereas by which uh, the impedance measured from the tip electrode increases. So you do not get a low impedance, you get a higher impedance. As to temperature, electrode temperatures depend upon irrigation, presence or absence of irrigation, and of course, out of delivery. So they may or may not increase, but increased tissue temperature has to happen with out of delivery, and that is the mechanism of action of out of lesion creation. So uh, to go on from there, effects of increased contact force, if we summarize, they include the following. Increased electrode tissue interface surface area, as the electrode, as you can see in the schematic below, gets buried into relatively soft or actually soft atrial myocardial ventricular myocardial tissue. Reduced electrode surface area exposed to low impedance blood, what we discussed a few um, uh, seconds ago. 
and as a result of increased burial into the tissue, reduced electrode tip sliding both in response to respiratory as well as cardiac uh, movement, tissue compression and thinning, we saw in that abstract from Matthew Wright that this is indeed occurs, tissue trauma has been known to occur with increased uh, tissue forces and we've worked on that. Higher tissue temperatures occur during RF delivery, as you saw from the uh, experimental data that I showed you from Oklahoma City and from my own laboratory, and therefore a higher probability of pop and a higher probability of extracardiac heating are a consequence of increased contact force as well. The ultimate aim of most uh, strategies of catheter ablation for complex arrhythmias, including atr atrial fibrillation, is to create continuous and transmural lesions. And as that term implies, or that phrase implies, there are two components. One is transmurality, and this is predominantly determined by energy delivery and contact force, whereas continuity is dependent on 3D localization and establishing contiguity between the adjacent borders of effective complete uh, transmural lesions. Here it's lesion shape, interlesion gap, and electrode sliding, which are all important. Whereas for transmurality, wall thickness, edema, and tissue com composition become important parameters that may or may not uh, make the difference between success and failure. I've chosen this slide to show you the effects of cardiac and respiratory motion on the upper left in a cartoon that shows you how the, the wall of the heart is moving, at least the atria. And on the right hand side, you can see the heart and lungs moving during dynamic acquired CT during a respiratory cycle showing you the extent and the magnitude of both cardiac and respiratory movement. And for effective lesion making, it is important that the castro remains stable at a given spot during these, or despite this motion. And increased contact force is one component of doing that. 3D precise 3D localization is important as well. But respiratory and cardiac movement can falsify the, the apparent stability of castro motion as indicated by 3D, uh, by 3D uh, imaging systems. We have actually tried to assess and to quantify variability of uh, contact force by looking at a simple parameter, that is the area under the real-time contact force curve. That can be expressed as the force time integral. And in in vitro studies, we've shown that this is an important determinant of lesion size. I, to summarize this study, we've shown that there is a linear relationship between the area under the real-time contact force curve, the force time integral, and the eventual lesion size. And we've determined three different patterns of contact, intermittent contact, where contact is lost in diastole, variable contact, where contact is maintained but is different in systole versus diastole, and constant contact, where the contact is relatively invariable, such as in atrial or ventricular asystole and atrial fibrillation. And not surprisingly, constant contact provides the largest lesion size, whereas intermittent contact provides the smallest lesion size. And this becomes and is known, has been shown to be important. I do not have the time to go into detail with all the studies, but the three clinical studies stand out. The Toccata, the first study that looked at feasibility and safety. Efficus 1 that looked at uh, local correlates of contact force parameters and gaps based on a restudy at three months of PV isolation and Efficus 2, which used parameters derived from Efficus 1 and prospectively implemented them in a strategy that evaluated reconduction at three months with a restudy after PV isolation. So Toccata showed that a mean contact force of more than 20 grams or equal to 20 grams improves 12-month successful clinical outcome for PV isolation to more than 80%. Efficus 1, in which patients were restudied three months later to look at local contact force parameters, showed that the worst ablation in each segment determines the overall success, not surprisingly the weakest link. And this weakest link should be greater than 10 grams with a minimum force time integral of at least 400 gram seconds to minimize gap occurrence. And in Efficus 2, when these parameters were actually implemented, this resulted in a superior success rate, in fact a 98% success in PV isolation with continuous lesions. More recently, we've seen two important uh, studies that have evaluated the effectiveness in, multi in a multi-center protocol uh, of these contact force sensing catheters. The SMART AF study is a single arm prospective multi-center open label study in patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, chiefly in centers in the United States. 
In this, in this uh, study, they performed post hoc analysis of optimal force values in patients undergoing uh, contact force based PV isolation. As these graphs, uh, graphs Kaplan-Meier outcome curves of AFib freedom on the upper right show you, when the contact force was within the investigator's selected range more than 80% of the time, a high success rate, a significantly high success rate of 88% was observed at 12 months follow-up. Whereas without that, with, with a contact force outside this range, the success rate was lower, significantly lower at 66%. Similarly, the TOCA-STAR study, a prospective randomized multicenter non-inferiority study, compared the Tacticath contact force catheter versus a non-contact force thermocool irrigated catheter, again, with a primary effectiveness and safety endpoint, but also a prospectively determined uh, secondary, uh, secondary uh, contact force utilization endpoints. Similar to the SMART-AF study, this study defined optimal contact force during the procedure as the achievement of more than 90% of lesions with more than 10 grams of contact force. And with such a cutoff, when the cutoff was fulfilled, a high success rate of 85.5% was achieved versus a lower success rate of 67% without such parameters. This was also correlated with a lower uh, incidence of repeat ablations in the um, patients who fulfill the optimal contact force criteria. This just goes to show that it's, not, not, it's, it's important to un underline the fact that just ha using or having a contact force catheter is not enough. You need to actually use it optimally with the optimal parameters, much as you would uh, if you were driving a fast car. You need to be able to know how to drive it fast. I spoke earlier about contact force variability, and this study in 25 patients prospectively looked at the effect of rhythm and respiration. And uh, in this cohort of 25 patients, they found that about 31% of contact force variability was due to respiratory changes or respiratory movement. And another 39% was because of cardiac systole or diastolic movement. Interestingly, they used adenosine to create intermittent AV block and thus eliminate ventricular contraction, and they found that ventricular contraction had a greater effect than atrial contraction. Finally, and what remained, uh, what remains to, uh, important is the fact that the remaining 30% approximately of contact force variability could not be explained either by rhythm or by respiration, and was presumably due to cardiac sliding, cardiac electrode sliding motion provoked by cardiac or respiratory motion uh, and gastro instability. What has been an eye-opener, Richard, in my experience in using the contact force caster is that real-time contact force allows me to have a very critical eye on the effect of respiration on contact. Kumar and his colleagues in Australia l evaluated both KO trichosplasmus ablation and AFib ablation with PVI under, in, in patients under general anesthesia, delivering some lesions under ventilation and others uh, during apnea. And they showed that there was a drop in contact force with each respiratory swing. And as these bars show you, the mean contact force and the mean force time integral were significantly higher both in both anatomical locations during apnea than during respiration or during ventilation. And that the lower forces correlated with a higher incidence of conduction recovery, pointing and underlining the importance of contact force and the correlation with respiration. I have put together this slide to give you give users a few tips on the appropriate and the best use of ca contact force casters. It is important to realize that these contact force are, uh, sensors are mechanical sensors which need appropriate zeroing. And therefore, there is the possibility of under or overestimation of contact force resulting from improper zeroing. Although in my own experience, it's more frequently an overestimation than an underestimation. I'd recommend that the contact force caster be re-zeroed after every reintroduction into the vascular system or into a, a sheath. I find that using a contact force caster with a long sheath provides a strong synergy, stability, and control of contact force, but contact force accuracy can be unfavorably affected if the sheath is advanced too distally too close to the contact force sensor, which is at the distal tip of the caster. 
In addition, extreme distal seg segment flexion within the sheath can interfere with the optical CF sensor's function, whereas electromagnetic interference can reduce the accuracy of the electromagnetic CF sensor. Of course, it's important to note that the, the, the biosense card of system indicates the possibility of this error with uh, warnings, uh, appropriate warnings of sheath as well as electromagnetic interference. I alluded earlier to the fact that Casper stability is nearly as important or as important as contact force. And in this Japanese study, they evaluated 50 patients uh, with circumferential wide uh, area ablation. And for uh, analyzing the weak points in that circumferential lesion, they first looked at stability parameters, uh, utilizing an automated lesion tag, which mandated a motion range of less than two millimeters with a temporal stability of uh, 10 seconds or more. Based on that, they detected a certain number of weak points or uh, points of uh, recovered conduction. And then they secondarily added uh, parameters th uh, of force uh, uh, over time uh, over a certain threshold. And these significantly identified additional gaps. And finally, they were able to also show that stricter catheter stability settings with more strict force time integral settings provided a better sensitivity to detect uh, sites of recovered conduction uh, acutely and potentially than uh, sites with lower or less strict categories. Thus, again, pointing to the importance of uh, caster stability in conjunction with contact force. Beyond contact force and caster stability, what remains include electrogram changes and wall thickness. In this study, again from Japan, 18 patients underwent wide area circumferential ablation. And in these patients, the authors found 72 sites with dormant conduction. They looked at electrogram changes, impedance changes, contact force parameters, CT-based wall thickness at these sites. And they found that these sites of dormant conductions were strongly associated with thickened PVLA junction wall, but not with electrogram-based information or with contact force, indicating clearly the potential importance of wall thickness. We have two types of contact force sensing casters on the market. How accurate are they? We do not have any head-to-head -head comparison, but baseline parameters suggest that they are accurate to within one gram at a maximum value of uh, 50 to 100 grams. These two different studies from the same center, in fact, used an externally calibrated pressure transducer to look at the accuracy of these casters at, at different uh, angles and different, uh, in different situations. And what they found is that in, at a 90 degrees angle, the uh, electromagnetic sensor performed somewhat less well compared to the optical force sensor as also when the sheath was advanced up to the proximal aspect of the proximal electrode. It remains to be said, however, it remains to be underlined, however, that we do not know the actual significance of this clinically. And also, uh, it's also equally important to note that clinically, uh, 180 degrees position or parallel to the complete, completely parallel to the tissue is is un, is infrequently achieved, at least in my own experience. In today's age, we are constantly asked to compare the two standard techniques, or what have become two standard techniques of PV isolation: radio frequency caster ablation versus cryoablation, and more particularly, contact force-based PV isolation versus cryoablation. In this uh, context, Chikonte et al. compared 56 consecutive patients, that is uh, 36 with, um, with uh, 30 patients with contact force caster ablation PVI versus 26 with cryoballoon-based cryo PVI. These patients all had recurrence, and he compared the sites, compared the, patient, the, the, the parameters of persistent isolation versus late reconnection, both in the cryoballoon and in the contact force category. And in the cryoballoon, nadir temperatures were slightly higher for the reconnection group. The time to isolation was later. But I do not understand, or I am not totally very clear about how one could optimize these parameters to achieve better outcomes. Whereas in the contact force category, you can clearly see that in the late reconnection group, the contact force parameters were significantly lower, significantly poorer compared to in the persistent isolation. And this is potentially clearly and simply correctable with an increased contact force. Uh, 
of course, additionally, with a point-by-point -point ablation strategy, residual conduction sites can be selectively targeted, which represents a potential advantage over cryo-balloon ablation. Another multiple choice question for you. Again, which of the following statements is or are true? Optimizing contact force during ablation allows more precise lesion control than previously possible? Or does it result in larger lesions than previously possible? Or does it result in more effective ablation outcomes? Or does it reduce complications such as perforation, tamponade, and atriosophyll fistula? Right, so while the audience is answering that, we're running very tight for time now. So I want to try and get two questions in that they've asked us. Uh, firstly, does the use of contact force sensing improve or increase your confidence of doing persistent AF ablation? That's question number one. And the question number two is a fixed FTI. Is It says, is it too little for the anterior ridge for 400 and too much for the inferior? How do you adjust your contact force stuff? Two, 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 two very relevant questions. The actual value of uh, optimal contact force targeting for persistent AFib has yet to be clearly shown. But in my own experience, I find that uh, the use of optimal contact force results in faster, more effective, and less recurrence-prone PV isolation as a component of uh, persistent AFib ablation. And I do believe that that has contributed to better results, although I do not have um, controlled data. Um, as far as the second question goes, we will address that in upcoming slides. But clearly, uh, the, the anatomy is different in different parts of the heart, and therefore you probably do need different targets for different parts of the heart, different stability parameters, and different likelihood of achieving um, uh, collateral damage. Great. So we've got two to three minutes left. So everyone said, or the majority said, that they felt it resulted in more effective ablation outcomes. All right. I think that uh, uh, has been shown, at least in certain segments, such as PV isolation, but in not strictly controlled outcomes, uh, uh, strictly controlled randomized comparisons. Uh, I'm optimistic that we will have such data in, in, in future in, in multi-center controlled um, situations. But I think the most important compo answer here, or the most correct answer, is, the, is answer one, which allows more precise lesion control than previously possible. Let's move on then, as we are running short of time. So if we summarize the benefits of real-time contact force measurement, they include objective real-time recognition of absence of contact, reduction in ineffective ablations, better control over lesion size, better arrhythmia-free outcome after PVI for PAF in patients in whom optimal contact force has been achieved, improved specificity for low-voltage substrate, and you'll hear more about it later from my colleague, reduced trauma during castor manipulation, and uh, it's a key to monitoring influence of respiration on contact. One of the uh, very promising future avenues of optimal use of contact force parameters and our understanding of lesion making is to predict and to evaluate lesion size and therefore to predict weaknesses in our lesions. If you look at this data that has been reworked from this Efficus 1 study, mean force alone allowed prediction of gap sites with a sensitivity which is a p-value of 0.001. The addition of the parameter of time, such as force time integral, increased the sensitivity with a p-value of less than 0 0.0001. But when power was in in incorporated in this nonlinear relationship that derived so-called lesion size index, this allowed an unparalleled efficacy in uh, sensitivity and specificity in detecting gaps with a p-value which was a p less than 10 raised to minus 7. A study in 40 proximal AFib patients from uh, the UK uh, found that an ablation index, which is another non-linear parameter incorporating both power, force, and time, allowed a clear and uh, very specific recognition of gaps versus persistent uh, isolation. And they were able to show in patients who were restudied two months later that a higher ablation index and a higher force time integral value was required for anterior roof segments than for posterior inferior segments to prevent reconnection, just as an answer to that question that came in earlier. So then to conclude, contact force sensing, where are we going to and in what direction should we actually push? Precise and accurate lesion prediction 
incorporating not only contact force, power and time, but tissue, electrogram, convective and castrative parameters, which will enable us to reduce and eliminate gaps in ablation lines. We are going to be forced to reevaluate voltage criteria for <coughs> ventricular and atrial scar in the context of contact force. We will incorporate this measure into multi-electrode ablation design to make ablation faster. And then we may even integrate it into robotic castor manipulation to provide fully automated ablation. Thank you, Richard. Fabulous. Um, kept perfectly to time as well. Uh, there's you. some great questions coming in, so I hope we'll have some time to then come back to them uh, at the end of the uh, seminar. But I'm going to move us on to Roland Tills's uh, talk. Uh, Roland's going to talk about ventricular tachycardia ablation. Yeah, dear Richard, um, thank you for the introduction. Dear ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. After this fantastic uh, talk from Professor Diepenshaw, it's now a pleasure to speak about tachycardia ablation. These are my disclosures. So as you heard in the previous talk, the uh, factor that parameter lesion quality, our goal is to get great lesions in order to get effective ablation and at a low complication rate. So what does a drive lesion uh, quality? It's the power, it's the temperature, it's the duration, it's the contact force, and it is the force direction, which is particularly important in epicardial VT ablation. So I would like to come to my first question. Do you use a contact force catheter uh, for VT ablation? Almost never, which means less than 5%. In a minority of VT cases, which is 6 to 50%. In a majority of VT cases, which is 51 to 95%. Or in almost all cases, which is more than 95%. So while the audience is ask, answering this, maybe I can ask both of you. Uh, we've been asked, uh, what about Brigada ablation and inherited arrhythmias like arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy? Do, do you feel more confident ablating these types of rhythms with contact force? Uh, let me ask Roland first and then Deepen, if I may. Yeah, so um, very good questions. Uh, Brugada ablation um, is maybe different as compared to ARBC ablation. I think in Brugada ablation, we did ablation in a few Brugada patients, but I think these are highly, highly selective patients uh, that may benefit from this ablation procedure, and it's, as you know, ablation of the outflow tract and of the epicardial ablation. In ARVC patients, it's usually an epicardial substrate, and I would always um, perform a contact force guided ablation in patients with structural heart disease and ventricular tachycardia. That's our institutional standard. Perfect. And Deepen, what? I, I'll, I'll give you a short answer. I think in the right ventricle, which is inherently thin-walled, I like the use, like having the, the use of contact force that allows me to control lesion making and my potential for creating damage and perforation, both these uh, strategies. Perfect. So uh, we've got an even split in the answers here, Roland, uh, but around 40% almost never use contact force for VT ablation. Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. It would be interesting to know why, whether it's money, but this would be a separate question that we didn't prepare, well, or whether it is uh, belief or whatever. Send so in, I think it's extremely send, valuable. Send in some more, uh, comments, audience, and let us know. Yes, it would be very interesting. So what are the special considerations that we have for VT ablation? It's first, it's the access. The access is more complex as compared to AF ablation. You get more kinking if you uh, choose to retrograde uh, transiotic approach, and additionally have more curves, including the aortic arch. Uh, you can also choose the anti-crate transeptal approach, but there you again have more curves as compared if you just end, uh, end up in left atrium. You also often need an epicardial access. Second, the anatomy and the substrate is more complex. You have an inflow and an outflow tract, you have papillary muscle, you have the valves, so the anatomy is more complex. And the, the force direction is more important as compared to um, atrial ablation. Third, the left ventricular wall thickness is very uh, highly variable in between patients, but also in the same patients depending on the region. In patient in post myocardial infarction patients, the substrate might be very thin of just a few millimeters, whereas in patients with hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy, you ha might have a septum which is several centimeters. And last but not least, an important consideration is the complication rate. 
you must not perforate the ventricle. If you perforate, if you have a steam bob with the hole in the ventricle, it usually requires surgery. So um, starting with the excess, the excess, as I said, is often more uh, difficult and you have more bending before you enter the left, uh, the left ventricle. This is a patient where we had to choose the left um, a retrograde approach because the patient came in the VT storm and had a um, ICT implanted just two or three days before in the referring hospital. And you see the patient is huge kinking, kinking and it's only possible to enter the left ventricle by a long sheet that you might see now. And even if you add, um, end up with the sheet in the aortic arch, there is still bending and uh, you still have a kinking. So the, the tactile feedback with the retrograde approach is even worse as compared to the tactile feedback um, if you do an atrial map. But you can also choose the integrate um, transeptal approach. And again, there the tactile feedback is worse as compared to atrial mapping. But what is the better approach? We performed a small study where we performed a retrograde aortic and an anticrate transeptal map in 10 patients. Both patients, um, all patients underwent both maps and uh, we analyzed the contact force. And you see the upper bars represent the anticrate map, the lower bars the retrograde map. Blue indicates a contact force of less than 10 gram, a green 10 to 40 gram, yellow 40 to 100 and um, red more than 100 um, uh, gram. I don't want to go, uh, get into the details, but what I would like to highlight is that there, that you have a very large variety of uh, contact force values. You have many points with a very low contact force, which may result in ineffect uh, ineffective lesion formation, but you also have very high contact force value, uh, values, which might be dangerous. So which is better? Is it the anti-grade or the, better, uh, the retrograde approach? On the right side now, you see the comparison of anti-grade versus retrograde map. And you can, uh, green means that the contact force anti-grade is higher as compared to the retrograde, and blue means that the retrograde contact force value will be higher. And what, this, uh, what you can nicely see is that in some regions, like basal anterior and mid-anterior and mid-lateral, you have a better contact force map if you perform an anti-grade approach, and in the remaining um, segments, you have a better map if you perform a retrograde approach. So the best, in my uh, opinion, I think the best solution is to do a combined approach. When I was trained, there were no contact force catheters available. And I, was, I learned that, that there is a correlation between impedance and contact force, and that you may use it as a surrogate parameter for contact force. So we analyzed the correlation between impedance and contact force in this um, study and found that there is a clear correlation between impedance and contact force. However, there is so much overlap between the groups you see, that it's not of any value in clinical practice. The same is true between correlation between bipolar amplitude and contact force. Bipolar amplitude increases with contact force but there is so much overlap between the different groups that it doesn't help you at all in a clinical case. What about the anatomy of the substrate? I said it's more complex. So the anatomy is more complex, as you can see on the next slide, it's a substrate which is more complex and you may have an endocardial as well as an epicardial substrate. Uh, Mitsuno at co-workers, they performed a contact force monitoring for cardio mapping in patients with ventricular tachycardia. And they analyzed the maps in 27 chambers, so 13 LB maps, 6 RB maps, and 8 epicardial maps. The operator was blinded to the contact force uh, uh, values and they performed an, a, transeptal, um, a transaortic approach in all patients and transeptal approach in five patients. What did they find? They found a correlation between bipolar signal amplitude and contact force, but there was again a very large overlap between groups, which is very consistent with our data. They also found a correlation between unip unipolar signals, amplitude and contact force, but again, large overlaps between groups as we found. So these two parameters are not of any value in clinical practice. However, I think a very important information from this paper is that uh, contact force 
required to obtain um, sister diastolic contact and the maps were 9, 8 and 8 a gram for the different chambers. So for me personally, it's something between a minimum contact force of 8 or better even 10 gram, which should be the minimum contact force if you perform ablation in the left, right ventricle or epicardially. What did they also find? They um, evaluated the impact of contact force of signal and found that if you have a poor contact force of only 3 gram, that you often find the slurred, very low voltage signals. And um, however, if you increase the contact force, you get very sharp signals with late potentials and a higher voltage amplitude. So good contact force is very important to better understand the substrate. We also uh, just mentioned that the anatomy is more complex and you have structures such as the papillary muscles. I would like to present just one patient. The patient is a 36-year-old gentleman who was referred with suspected amphetamine-induced cardiomyopathy. He checked with cycle length of 407 to 630 milliseconds. So we uh, found in the 12-week ECG, you uh, saw that the patient had a clearly VT with a retrograde P waves um, in, uh, at every fourth beat um, with the superior axis and in the precordial lead, you see a left bundle branch block morphology with the um, transition in uh, V5, V6. So it must be somewhere from the right ventricle um, um, infra rather apical. We performed a 3D map of the right ventricle and of, um, an, an activation map and found that the site of earliest activation and the site with the perfect pace map, it was floating inside the ventricle. So the um, origin must have been the moderator band, which we also confirmed, by the way, by echo. But you might have um, complex structures, origin of the VTs, from structures like papillary muscle or moderator band. And if you don't have contact force information, you don't have any feedback whether you have good contact, any contact, or no contact. So we performed ablation with a 35 watts, a contact force of 10 to 20 gram, and an ablation index of 550. What you also see in this map is there is a very big breakthrough area um, which projects at the site of earliest activation to the um, surface, which is typical for um, for um, origin through, uh, for, um, in the moderator band. So we performed ablation, and the VT terminated within 6.5 seconds after start ablation. The patient remained free of VT and was discharged with a life vest for three months. However, he came back six weeks after he had no recurrence, an ejection fraction of 59% um, and no ICD was implanted. There are other approaches to a target um, uh, VTs originating from papillary muscles or moderator band. You can use an ice catheter. It tells you that you are on the moderator band, but it doesn't help you to um, say whether you have a good or bad contact force. So what are other special considerations for a T-ablation? It's the contact force direction, which is particularly important if you perform epicardial ablation. You see at this bar that the patients that we perform in that, and the contact force is excellent, indicating with this green vector. However, the vector is uh, facing away from the myocardium, from the epicardium. So we direct the force and the current away from myocardium. On the right side, you see the vector, which is then curved towards the myocardium, and this is the right way to map and also to ablate apical VT. I think this is extremely helpful for apical VT ablation, such as in patients with ARVT or Brugada syndrome. Um, is this just our personal experience, or is there any scientific data? Um, the Bordeaux group published a paper uh, where they characterized the contact force during endocardial and epicardial VT mapping. 
And they found that during epicardial mapping, only 46% of the points showed an adequate force vector orientation facing the myocardium. And in the remaining, so more than 50%, the, uh, the myocardium was facing away from the myocardium. Um, the vector was facing away from the myocardium. They also found that when a vector orientation was inadequate, so facing away from the myocardium, the mean contact force was higher as compared to a uh, uh, vector orientating towards the myocardium. So good for contact force in the epicardium doesn't mean force facing the myocardium. In endocardial maps, it doesn't seem to be that important because 94% of the vector orientations were adequate. Last but not least, we said it's very important to avoid cardio, um, perforations in the ventricle or steam pops, and that's why we should also limit our contact force and limit our power up. Because if you have a complication like a perforation or steam pop, usually the patient needs to undergo surgery. So what is the next step? Is contact force the perfect value or do we need more data? Force, power, and time. These are the three key determinants for lesion formation. And we know that force and time correlate linearly. Um, lesion size correlates linearly with force and time. However, uh, power is a more important parameter as compared to force. And we know that um, the initial phase of the ablation is much more important than the later phase of the ablation. This is not part of the force time index. So we need a more complex uh, formula, the force power time formula, which was um, developed by Nak Nakagawa and co-workers. It's based on biophysics of the lesion formation um, on retrospective analysis and was validated um, with, um, in a kinine RV and LV model. And what he found is a very, very good lesion between, uh, correlation between predicted uh, lesion size and actual lesion size. So what is our practical workflow in Lübeck? We, whenever you use any of these automatic lesion visualization tools like uh, uh, ablation index or uh, Visitech, you need to respirate because otherwise the system doesn't know whether the catheter is moving because of the respiratory cir um, circuit. That's what you see, the movement on the left side, or whether the catheter is slippery. That's the typical movement for the right side. So first, you need to get, uh, activate the respiration gating and train the system. The second thing is we usually use, like 99% of all counter users, the average contact force for uh, mapping and ablation. If you use the system from St. Jude, usually it's the maximum force, or it's always the maximum force. Uh, that is displayed. So you have to keep in mind the two different catheters use different values, one the average and the other one the maximum force. The second thing, we use a force threshold for, of 10 to 40 gram because this is our target range with a, a maximum of 60 gram. If you have more than 60 gram, we get like a red a flash on the monitor to avoid uh, perforation. We display the vector and the dashboard, so we continuously monitor uh, the a contact force. Our stability maximum range is three millimeters for uh, each application with a stability minimum time for three millimeters in the atrium and usually tens, um, uh, three seconds in the atrium and 10 seconds in the ventricle. In addition, we use a surround flow catheter, so a porous type catheter, because then even in deep pouches, we can always deliver the current that we uh, that we want to, and we are not limited by a ca high catheter tip temperature. We need to activate the respirating gating, and all these tools only work if you use a point by point mapping strategy, but not a dragging strategy. As I said, the target values for lesion size are three millimeters stability, uh, minimum time three to ten seconds, depending on the chamber, and an ablation index for the ventricle of at least five hundred and fifty. The elation index is uh, visualized with uh, tags, and you see continuously the ablation index rising as you ablate. Um, it's the red number that is rising on the right lower corner. So 
we analyzed the ablation index value in a retrospective study. We just analyzed two patients so far using the ablation index software. We wanted to know the first time power uh, during a VT ablation. And in this study, we divided the ventricle into 12 segments, so basal, and lateral, inferior, and septal segments. And I don't want to show you all the details of the study, but the key message is that even though it was in the same ventricle, in the same region, we had a very different ablation index, so force time power values for different applications. We had very low values, which means inefficient uh, applications, and very high values, which means that there might be a higher risk for a steam bob and charring formation. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to come to my conclusion. Contact sensing for ablation, what have we learned for VT ablation? Contact force as well as vector orientation are important parameters to delineate the VT substrate and to successfully perform VT ablation. Recent studies have demonstrated that contact force visualization helps to reduce the incidence of excessively high contact force, potentially causing complications, and very low contact force values that may result in ineffective lesion formation. Consequently, the use of the contact um, force sensing catheter, if used appropriately, it has the potential to reduce complications by avoiding high contact force and improve efficacy by avoiding low contact force ablation. Further technological improvements, such as force time power formula indices, they may have the potential to further improve the lesion formation, and they also may help, uh, help to avoid collateral damage, such as potentially esophageal fistula formation by limiting the maximum lesion size. However, clinical trials providing the efficacy and safety profile are not published yet, but they are on the way. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Great, super talk, Roland. <clears throat> so I'd like to, uh, a number of the audience have asked us about one of those points that you made at the end of your conclusion slide. Uh, about complications with contact force. So we've had some comments, for example, that when they first started using contact force, they found their complication rates went up. They had a higher incidence of tamponade. Um, can I ask you both to comment on how what might be the mechanism for that happening, perhaps starting with you, Deepin, and then coming on to you, Roland? It's a relevant point. I think uh, if you look at the, uh, the data from Toccata, the first study with the contact force caster, uh, there was one tamponade that was temporarily um, associated with a high contact force of over 100 grams during castor manipulation. And I'm also aware of um, data from the SMART AF study, which suggests that uh, there was a non-significant uh, increase in the incidence of perforation and tamponade compared to control data, uh, retrospectively obtained control data, which suggests that... Um, an attempt to achieve a certain force target may be predisposing these patients to uh, perforation. Remember that these are patients who received ablation uh, lesions in the site, in the uh, close to the areas where manipulation is occurring, and we have, along with others, have shown that these are weak points in the atria and they're susceptible to lower thresholds of uh, perforation uh, forces than tissue which has not been modified by ablation or by disease. So I think uh, the, uh, the, the answer to that question is that there may be unrecognized episodes of high forces, one, and there may be unrecognized areas where the tissue is weaker than expected. And uh, so you, you, there's a potential for a false sense of security when using this technology? That, that, that is one of possible explanation, yes. Although uh, in my own experience, I haven't seen an increase uh, in, in uh, perforations and tamponades. And, and Ronan, what about atrial esophageal fistula? You mentioned that in your conclusions. Do you think this is likely to reduce the risk, or how do you use this technology to minimize that risk? So actually, I'm very glad about the question concerning the complication rate. And I think Deepen had a very wonderful saying. You know, it, it's like it's like a sports car. It's like a Porsche that you have now. It's more powerful, but you have to try and uh, know how to drive it. If you don't know how to drive it, it's more dangerous. So I think. I understand why people get higher complication rate, and I 
Personally, I have to admit, when we started using the SFST catheter, we also had more steam pops in the very first few cases. And the reason is, number one, it's a stiffer catheter. It's not like the non-contact force, non-surround flow catheter. Number one, the catheter is stiffer. Number two, uh, which is an advantage, but also disadvantage. You have more control, you get a better contact force if you want to, but you have to limit your power. Number two, the catheter um, you, you use with the surround flow catheter, it's a pure power controlled mode. Before we used, we called it a power controlled mode, but it was not uh, with the non-porous type, so with this um, non-surround flow uh, technology, with only six irrigation holes, it is a uh, it was cold power controlled, but it is also based to RF current delivered. There was like a ramp up time, number one. And number two, it was also impedance based, the RF current deliver. So usually with the SFST, if you want to apply 30 watts, you apply 30 watts after um, one second. And before you had like a ramp up time and uh, often you didn't deliver the 30 watts because you were limited by temperature. And the third reason, uh, in my opinion, is the it gives uh, the contact force values tell you the minimum values that you need to achieve and if the catheter is larger so the patient breathes you start with zero again and you always want to achieve this minimum value but you don't have like a maximum value um, at present time so i think you shouldn't be too strict and um uh, we need a maximum value for RF current delivery, particularly for the posterior wall. I think for these three reasons, initially the complication after what what is our what did we change? We reduced the power with the, with the stiffer catheter by five watts instead of 40 watts, reduced to to 35 watts, and we try to avoid excessive long RF um, applications. Um, Yes, I think these are, is the key message. And ablation index helps us to avoid excessive long um, key message um, RF applications. Okay, and I, I think one of the audience has made the very reasonable point that the catheter characteristics may be slightly stiffer than yes, ones yes. used before, and use of a sheath may also increase that risk as well. Um, we were also asked about the type of VT that we ablate, and I'm going to answer for us because we asked each other that question earlier on, and we're uh, most of you would use it for pretty much every type of VT that you you deal with, um, yes, and particularly would. for the inherited where their right ventricle may be fragile. So I'd like to now uh, conclude by saying that we're approaching the end of the webinar. Um, I'd like to close the session by reminding you of some of the key messages uh, for your daily practice. Contact force sensing is useful and a useful adjunct to the other data available during the catheter ablation procedure. It shouldn't be used in isolation and in ignorance of the other sensory data available. When used incorrectly, it can lead to a full sense of security and potentially increased risk. And when used correctly, it can improve the success to risk ratio of the ablation procedure. We're now going to close the webinar, but I'd like to thank Professor Shah and Tills for their fantastic presentations. Thanks to Biosense Webster, who supported this webinar with an unrestricted educational grant. I'd like to thank you also for sending in your questions and comments, and we hope you enjoyed this time with us. You will be able to view again this webinar offline in a few days on the ESC website. Uh, but on that note, I do hope you join us again for another ERA and ESC uh, webinar, and we do hope you've enjoyed the presentations today. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Deepen. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everybody.